Hello everybody, can you all hear me? Those of you who have already left, tough luck. Um, I stand between you and beer, and I apologize. I only have about 800 slides to get through. We'll go through them really quickly. So, um, this lovely lady on the slide you see here, that is my good friend, Justina. She is a group director at Adform. 60 people work for her. She's very technical, she's very competent, she's very capable. Her good looks are the least of her attributes. Her talent and skill shines brighter than anything else. So if there is a little girl in your life, a daughter, a niece, a cousin, encourage her to be involved in technology. Encourage her to find the joy that you have when the program that was running in your mind runs on the computer. So please do that for me. I'm going to talk about a few things today. We're going to have some definitions. I'm going to talk about the problem we faced at Adform, uh, the solution that I came up with, and I'm going to give you some Uncle Pete's advice. So Adform is an advertising technology company. In the blink of an eye, depending upon the time of the day and the day of the year, we will process between 800,000 and 2.4 million bid requests every time you blink your eye. Bid requests to display some kind of advertisement to a user. That advertisement is the reason we have free things in the internet. Advertising pays for the freeness. So we're big, we're fast, we're powerful, we're tough, we're exotic, we're fantastic. So let's start with a, little, a few definitions. Anarchy. So what is anarchy? Anarchy is a situation without rules. So you can have anarchy in a social situation, in a governmental situation. You can also have it in a software development situation. Most startups start with a form of benevolent anarchy. Anarchy is not bad. It allows you to do things really quickly but it doesn't scale. So what's sustainability? Well, we know what that is in an environmental situation. You know what that is when it comes to your bank, bank account and your income. So if your outgo is greater than your income, it's not sustainable. You'll eventually have a catastrophe at, at some point in your life. Okay, in business, sustainability is having a viable product or service forever. That means you continuously make money. If you've done any game theory, you'll know that, that business is an infinite game. You just want to stay in the game. Usability. What's usability? Usability in the simplest terms is that people want to use what you have. If you want to have a very, very secure system, that's, that nobody hacks into, make it something that nobody wants to use and they won't bother. So usability is what everybody wants to use. That's the plan. So at Adform, we had a problem. Here is our problem. We had an inconsistent user experience. So to use my native Australian, I would have said a shit user experience but I don't want to offend anybody, we'll stick to inconsistent. <laughs> we have 130 different applications. We had, we had multiple sign-on. Every JavaScript framework that you've ever heard of and some that you've never heard of. Um, multiple JavaScript dialects, like there's a war between pure ES6 people and TypeScript. And to me, that's a pub discussion. Uh, as you know what a pub discussion is, arguing which is the best religion or which is the best football team. There isn't really an answer. Um, we had no common UI components. We had every kind of web technology that you in your life have ever th heard of. How many of you are older than 38 years? Okay. Other than the three people who put their hands up, I was writing code before all of you were born. And so there is lots of web technology. We had little shared code and little shared services. Shared code was a friend of yours gave you some code that you used. How dumb is that? 
And we have what in ad form people call an API layer. It's really a services layer, but we have more than 400 public endpoints and more than 650 internal secret, somewhat compliant to standard endpoints. And it's a disaster. They all have their own unique dialects. So how you speak to one API and how you speak to another is different. You know, things like pagination, it might be offset and limit, or it could be page and page size. Uh -huh. um, everything. So what we have is a big bag of stuff. Loads and loads of features. You'll notice that I have used the band-aids there for a reason. It's good symbology. Uh, the user experience is a bit strange, but it makes money and it is usable. You just have to be trained to use it. Okay, that's not sustainable. So I've, I've given you four areas of our user-facing applications. So we have things like publishers, the people who publish a website and sell space. Then we have um, campaigns, the people who represent uh, advertisers who want to put something in the space of publishers, creative who make things to be put in the space of publishers, and the mystical DMP that trail through all of this noise and discover the signal that represents you inside it. Symbology, once again, we've got Lego, we've got a bespoke plastic model, we've got something made out of cardboard or card, and we've got Playmobil. That's good symbology as to the technology and problems we have in ad form. In addition, this is one navigation map in one of the small applications we have. The tiny blue things in there represent the pages, and the black lines represent the possible navigation paths, the link you can go through. Okay? This is anarchy. This is where you get to choose to do everything you want to do, and you do it for the best righteous reasons, but you end up with this. It's not sustainable. So a year and a half ago, uh, I courageously stood before the founders of the company and everybody at the sea level, and I told them this. It's marvelous. It's like, oh, perhaps I won't have a job next week, but not really. Okay, so we worked on that and uh, we got them to make a decision. We wanted to go from anarchy to reusability and sustainability. The goals are these. We want a consistent user experience. We want people to like to use the system and to guess how to do the things they haven't been trained in. What's a good user experience? Whether you love or hate Apple, it doesn't matter. They invented a thing called an iPad and before they brought it out, they took it to Mexico and an illiterate five-year-old was able to work out how to use it. That's the way we should build applications for user experience. We want to have uh, a portable practical front end so that if the UI change to exotic things, mobile devices, Siri or Alexa or whoever, or things that we haven't invented yet, we haven't thought of yet, Maybe in five years' time, we'll all be wearing contact lenses with augmented reality in the front of them. Who knows? We want to be able to have a user interface that works for that. We needed a common set of tools, common set of frameworks, a common language, data structures and patterns, and software engineers who could move from one project to another without having to get a new degree uh, you know, a PhD in, in data management or a PhD in campaigns. They don't have to relearn for six months before they can become productive. Okay, the solution, and this is my fault. Uh, there's a quiz on this afterwards, by the way. You need to copy down all of this, and I'll be asking questions. No, I'm, I'm not. So we wanted a front end that was a single web page application for crying out loud. This is the second half of the second decade of the 21st century. We should be doing things the same way that we'd learnt 20 years ago, but somehow got lost in the 2000s. Single web page application, common components, a common style, a modular approach to doing things, single sign-on, reusable, uh, uh, best way to describe reusable things I called applets, 
reusable problem solvers, and a declarative navigation system. And I'll get into those a little bit later on. On the back end, we wanted to have a single endpoint. So you don't have to know more than one, and a single dialect to speak to that endpoint. So there was only one language involved, one protocol involved speaking to the endpoint. And then we wanted a modular way to describe the entities that related to the business. The other thing we instituted was this notion of personas. If you were a, a, a UML person, you will know these as actors, and that an actor had a use case or a set of use cases. Well, personas and scenarios are the same thing. So who uses the system and what do they do with it? When somebody wants to add a feature, which persona is going to use that feature? Why is it being added? You can tell the difference between a feature factory and a, a software engineering shop based upon whether you're just building features every day and you don't do any real uh, architecture. So we picked some standard technologies. Now, I'm not, I'll confess I'm not a front-end guy. Um, I know how to design user interfaces and why they're designed, but I really don't care about the framework. But I have with a great uh, front-end architect and he said, we're going to use React. And I went, OK. Whether you like it or not, that's what we're using. We're going to use that throughout the company. And we're not going to have uh, tea club meetings and conspiracy theorists, theorists and gossipists to create reasons why we shouldn't use it. We're going to use GraphQL, front end to back end communication. GraphQL to um, distributed computing is the same as SQL was to data, to data store. And I was around before there was SQL, so if you want to know what it was like, talk to me later. We picked Node.js in the back end. Amongst some battles and furor, we picked that. Uh, we use OAuth 2, an OpenID Connect, which is a layer on top of OAuth 2 for our, for our authentication and authorization. Uh, our open APIs that are REST-based, we use Swagger 2. Swagger 3 is out, we're using Swagger 2. We've just got to try and get everybody to use the same stuff, and then maybe we'll upgrade. Um, we shifted, we're a big .NET uh, shop, and we've shifted from .NET to .NET Core. And you'll see why in a few slides time. And we use Docker and Kubernetes, technologies we picked. So if you're a business developer, you're going to build a, a business solution, you have to just write an applet to display some pieces of information. I haven't told you what an applet is yet. Um, and maybe a workflow that describes the navigation between them. Backend components is a module for GraphQL to, to describe a portion of the schema. And you're going to be good and you're going to write tests everywhere. I liked this morning when we talked about, um, what was it, the, uh, the test trophy, where it was mostly integration tests. Well, guess what? For all my career, that's exactly the pattern of testing that would go on. All my career, it was that way around. But sometime in the early 2000s, everybody got the, the technical hard on about unit testing. And they wanted code coverage, even if the tests were shit. I've got 100% code coverage. Doesn't actually test anything, but we're all covered, right? <laughs> There's a bunch of uh, anecdotes I could tell at this point which would probably breach the code of conduct. So the front end, components, applets, and workflows. The first thing is we wanted to have a single web page application that we called the one application. You'll notice on the screen in yellow, some boxes which show some delineation. These indicate or hint to the presence of an applet. So we started out with React, what React gives you, and we built components out of them, standard components. At one stage in AdForm, we had 48 list components. Um, so we built components and composite components, so they all look the same. Then we take those components and we put them inside an applet, which is nothing more than a high order component in React. 
it is a single problem solver that contains some business. So I've got to be really quick. And then we built workflows for navigation. So what's an applet? If you use Word, you'll notice there are things you can embed inside Word. There isn't a picture viewer built into Word or an Excel viewer built into the Word. It's just an ActiveX control or an applet. Example of a workflow. You do this all day. You want to send somebody an email, send them a photograph. So you pick some few things and the photograph appears inside the email. The email application doesn't know anything about photographs. It only knows about MIME type attachments. So the applet was a small problem solver. It did one thing. Knows how to get data, knows how to put data to sleep, knows how to have the user behave. It is kind of like a promise. It is apathetic of uh, who uses its information and it's ignorant of who calls it. Okay, just like a subroutine. Sub so applets were small problem solvers that you can, or visual problem solvers that you stitch together to provide a solution, as in this slide. A workflow is a reusable business scenario that glues together several applets. So you, you're familiar with this kind of a process. We just talked about it. We're going to send an email, take a picture, put it in the email, do something to do with that. You navigate between these by some sort of gesture or dialogue or action with the system. You can abstract this activity out into a finite state machine. In second year at university, who remembers finite state machines when you did uh, data structures? You thought you'd never use them? Well, the applets are the states. And the events the applets emit are the state transitions. And the state machine takes you to where you're going to go. This means you don't have link mess and you don't run out of heap space in your application, in your browser. I have used a finite state machine in user-facing applications for 29 years in green screen, in GUIs, and in web applications. Not that un hard to do. Really easy. You abstract the responsibility of knowledge of who is going to use you or who you're going to call out to something else. So back end. One of the things that suffered over the last uh, 20 years or so is the loss of the notion of a business entity or an entity described in any way. People hated drawing the models. They hated being disciplined by them. Uh, if you're a, um, a domain-driven design person, you'll understand the importance of them. But they represent the real things in the business. So we had to introduce a common schema. Not there before. Why do we bother introducing a common schema? So that we could introduce GraphQL. Here is an example of a front end component calling some things in the back end. It makes sense to do one big request of all the things you want, send it to the fast part of the world, get the response back through the slow part of the world. Okay? I had to explain that diagram about eight times and had people argue with me. Have you proven this? And I went, oh. So we've decided to use GraphQL as the conversation between the front end and the back end for the remote procedure call, for the distributed event, which they call subscriptions. That's the mechanism. That's the dialect. We have a schema server, a schema server that describes the schema of all the entities that has access inside of Adform. You can do operations on that. You can read stuff and you can write stuff. Sort of CQRS, isn't it? We divided the schema up into modules so that a business uh, unit would be responsible for a portion of the schema and we would collect all of these modules together and stitch them into a composite schema. Everybody had to cooperate. You couldn't have type clashes and you had to be friends and you had to actually talk to the other groups. So that's the back end. That's the simplest version of the back end. We did a few different things in uh, 
in the DevOps world, though. First of all, we introduced a real pipeline. So we use GitHub, GitHub Enterprise, because that's the decision. We use Drone as our CI CD. We have Helm charts that help us describe declaratively how we're going to run things in Kubernetes. And we store things in our own repository, artifacts in our own repository using JFrog's artifactory. We finally, finally went to containers. Adform was a place where we ran a million Windows VMs on top of either Windows or on top of um, Linux. And sometimes we ran Linux VMs on top of Linux. Just, just dumb. Uh, so we've, we've gone to um, containers. If you're not sure how containers work, they're essentially uh, Linux C groups where you're limited to a certain portion of the machine. They're nice. They're great isolation. So to orchestrate those without getting the Docker blues out of it, we went to Kubernetes. Kubernetes is a way to orchestrate your containers for failover and load balancing and uh, uh, high availability, high reliability. And it is a Google product, but who cares? It works. We also instituted common services for crying out loud with OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect. That's now a service in AdForm. You don't write it in your application. We used Elk for our logging. So you can write stuff and magically you have just a, a, an appender that sits in your log. It really goes to Elk and you can search it later on. We use Grafana and Prometheus for uh, instrumentation. So Grafana shows us pretty things. Prometheus is the metrics. And it's the simplest, dead easiest thing to use. OK, I got a few minutes, and we're going to do Uncle Pete's advice. First up, you will make an investment in your engineers. Engineers do something that nobody else does. They create something from nothing. How many of you have seen the, uh, the program in your mind and suddenly you write it down and it runs in front of you? You get a rush when it works. Okay? There's nothing that it describes how you feel at that moment and you don't care if anybody else knows. It's wonderful. Engineers have an opinion and they think it's right. They have their favorite technologies and they love to argue. One of the comments is that um, uh, Engineers are like um, arguing with an engineer is like wrestling with a pig. Eventually, you realize that the pig enjoys it. <laughs> so, but as engineers, we are more creative than musicians or authors or movie makers. What goes on in our brains? Let me get this right. You sit down for two or three hours, and all this stuff's floating around in your head, and you write it down with some code. If somebody interrupts you partway through, it frustrates you and you've got to start again, right? Guess what? Me too. Then we go to the other side of the world, then we have DevOps engineers. DevOps engineers are like Scotty on the Enterprise. Captain Kirk says, give me warp factor five. And Scotty complains about it, <laughs> says it's impossible. And then that afternoon, it's all running. I said that I wanted to use Kubernetes, and they said we won't be ready for six months. And three weeks later, we had a production environment running. Outstanding. The other thing we're in was we're not in the IT industry, we're in the fashion industry. Every couple of years, something new comes out. Pay attention to what you used to know and apply it to the new thing. Don't believe the bullshit or drink the Kool-Aid on the new technology as being wonderful. Take with you your skill and your knowledge. And don't expect things to be constant. You may be a wizard in JavaScript, but in your life, something will replace it. Something will replace the uh, framework, the technology that you currently use. Adapt. See this telephones on the screen. That was a telephone in my home when I was little. And now I have a supercomputer in my pocket that is amazingly powerful, that can recognize my voice, does all that signal processing to do that, that, that recognition. That signal processing, by the way, came out of all of that work that the uh, US Navy did to recognize the sound of Soviet submarines in the ocean. 
So accept the change, adapt for it, and retrain. And that's my short version of this presentation. Any questions? Who has a question for Mr. Milne? Someone, somebody asked me what programming language did I first ah, program in. Here's a good one. And the answer is? Pascal. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm a little bit curious about the RESTful services that, that you all have at AdForm, um, mm -hmm. mainly because they're exposed via GraphQL interface. So I'm wondering if there was further consideration there about back-end inter-service communication. Was REST, rather, why was REST chosen? And was ah, things like gRPC ah. considered? OK, this is a very interesting question. So the question is about why are we using REST internally in AdForm and not something nice, uh, technically seductive, fast and powerful and modern like gRPC. OK, I think I've answered the question. Uh, inside a big organization, we have 350 developers, and we probably have uh, 80 concurrent projects. And architecture in AdForm is brand new. So the initial step, the initial toe in the pool, was to wrap some of the REST APIs and put a GraphQL front end on them. That was the first step. The commandment from Uncle Pete is that from new user-facing uh, services will need to have a GraphQL interface where we'll link to them remotely by the remote link capability. But I would love it if the inter-service communication, the IPC, inter-process communication inside of AdForm was something modern and sensible like gRPC. That would require us to have a, a, an entity, a business entity model. And I would have to convince some recalcitrant look the word up, recalcitrant software engineers, that this was a change and that they weren't going to lose their jobs. OK? Uh, there are many people in AdForm who have uh, become baptized members of the REST community. And that's a very good question to ask. So please, remember, technologies change. I have a master's degree in computer science. It was all before you were born. And it was a uh, master's degree in distributed computing. And I used DCE and Corbar. Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. No, yeah. And then it was uh, DCOM, and then it moved on to other things. So things change. Other questions? Next. Come on, this guy is a wealth of information. He's like, we hit the jackpot here. You must have another question. Someone. Uh-huh. Uh, can you tell us maybe a little bit about the security? Because everything what's new, it brings like lack of a security and all those. OK, so security problems. is an interesting component of it. So there is the authentication part where you are positively identified as being the user you claim to be. So we uh, have a service inside of AdForm that delegates that completely, and it uses OpenID Connect for that. Authorization is a far more sophisticated process you know that you can uh, defend a portion of your API system with an OAuth scope, which is a, a mechanism that's proven, that's verifiable. It's a, inside your access token. In addition to that, you have the notion of um, permissions, what you're allowed to do inside the application. So um, you may have paid for the cat portion of the application or the dog portion of the application, but not the owner portion of the application. So you have to build some kind of secure way to secure the permissions that you can display to a user in the interface or to check their behavior when they get to the back end. So this is usually outside the simple purvey of, a, uh, of an access token. You can use, um, I can't remember the term, you can use the, uh, what they call I'll remember it after I finish speaking. You can use parts of an access token to give you, but the access token could become very, very big. And you usually pass the access token as a bearer token in the header. So you can't have an elephant that represents your capabilities being sent from front end to back end. Otherwise, you'll spend 99% of your latency in the header and 2% in the, in the actual business part of it. So you may have to have the notion of uh, capabilities or permissions that live in two places. 
something that you present to the user, but in a uh, summary way that you can pass on to the back end for people to access. It's not a trivial subject, and there isn't a one shot that fits all. They're called claims in an <laughs> access token. As an American, we know this term, claims, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's with a capital of uh, lawsuits and claims. Security, my God, very good question. Anyone else have a question for Mr. Milne? Let's see. There's, there's two of them over there, so don't... Yes, no, I'm, I'm here okay. for the long run. So, uh, I got a question. Uh, so, how long did it took to uh, first... Archi the, well, well, maybe another way. Uh, was it like on one single pass to, to do the whole architecture to choose the technologies? Oh, uh, no. And how long did it took and what was the size of the team that was actually uh, architecting it and then implementing it? Okay, so it's a, it's a different kind of a question. So about a year and a half ago, I stood in a conference room with the CIO, the front-end architect, the UX uh, expert, I won't say designer because he does more than that, and the VP of, of platform, and we all went, who else feels like we have to rewrite ad form? Just the user-facing applications, not the bits that run inside. So me and the uh, front-end architect sat down. I said, what's the best technology? What's your favorite one? What's the one that works? And he came up with that. I coined the phrase of applet because it's been around for years, and it works, and it's like an active X control, but for the web. Think of it like that. Then we looked at the back-end technologies, and uh, a colleague of mine had looked at GraphQL. So I looked at GraphQL. Here's a little anecdote. I, eventually was, I initially was going to write the back end as a prototype in Scala, because you can use the, the ACA library and scale it really nicely, and it does, it, it's pretty good. It gives you a nice flat uh, performance graph, and it works in JVMs, which could work in containers. But after three weeks of working in GraphQL in Scala, my hair was dark before I started that, by the way. <laughs> I, I kept reading. I went, oh, all the tools are for JavaScript. So please don't kill me at this. But I used to think JavaScript was Satan's phlegm, OK? I saw JavaScript 15 years ago, and it was just a sack of shit. So um, I came back, and I, um, I thought, oh, all right, I'll try it. So I, I learned about enough Node.js for the first time and I learned enough JavaScript, and I not learned enough Apollo tools to implement in three days what I had done in three weeks in Scala. Now, I know Scala, but I learned Node, JavaScript, Apollo in three, three days and built the solution. So, from that point on, I wouldn't let anybody argue with me. The uh, architecture evolved over two or three months a lot of prototyping by me and the other architect. So a lot of the time I didn't know what I was doing in JavaScript, so that was where that spent. And it still has moved on. Now it's reasonably stable. I only showed you a small portion of it. It's expanded considerably about what we put in the front end, uh, like an auth component in the front end, and internationalization and stuff like that. But uh, surprisingly easier to architect and code examples on than it is to convince people to change to use it. More time is spent in the convincing than it would take to just do it yourself. Yes, but you have to convince them because you can't scale yourself. You, ah, yes, they, they just think I'm an old fart who doesn't know what he's talking about, so it's okay. <laughs> Uh, so I was interested, how did you, ma before the rewrite and now, how did you manage the architecture, the complexity? I mean, like, did you use some kind of software, like, there is a new feature and you have, like, 1,000 endpoints and you <laughs> need to change, like, 50 of those? How did you know, like, which one? Ah, and well, that's a software engineering question, not an architectural one, so I can say I'll push that aside. But it's really an organizational question. So we live with half with most of the, the environment still running the way it was. And we have a thunk layer which allows the new stuff to can talk to the old stuff and the old stuff to talk to the new stuff. We're going through a lengthy process of people who own those pieces of infrastructure, those, those services, to tell us about them, to own up and be honest, 
and say, yes, it's good, or no, it's bad, or it's great. So it's an organizational problem, not a technology one. It's hard. <laughs> That's the answer. <laughs> not easy is the answer. I love it. OK, anyone else? We have time for one more. We have time for one more question, I believe. Be quick. Uh, hi, great talk. Uh, I have a question related more to your immense experience rather than the art form. Uh, what, was, what was the communication uh, before inventing emojis? How did you maintain it? Um, well, the problem with that is uh, before the invention of emojis, it was mostly done in email and uh, you often expressed yourself in Australian terms with people. So if you're not sure what Australian terms are, please, everybody who's offended by swear language, Australians call, they don't call a spade a spade. They call a spade a fucking shovel. <laughs> so oftentimes there was uh, a creative, colourful metaphors used to express uh, a certain emotion in an email text. I actually remember those times, sir, I must say. Okay, I'm done. Everybody, please give Mr. <laughs> Neil a very big hand. Fantastic, fantastic experience. All right.